Chapter 130 The Hat And now that at the proper time and place, after so long and wide a preliminary cruise, Ahab, all other wailing waters swept, seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold, to slay him the more securely there, now, that he found himself hard by the very latitude and longitude where his tormenting wound had been inflicted, now that a vessel had been spoken which on the very day preceding had actually encountered Moby Dick, and now that all his successive meetings with various ships contrastingly concurred to show the demoniac indifference with which the white whale tore his hunters, whether sinning or sinned against, now it was that there lurked a something in the old man's eyes, which it was hardly sufferable for feeble souls to see. As the unsetting polar star, which through the live-long, arctic, six-months' night sustains its piercing, steady, central gaze, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. It domineered above them so, that all their bodings, doubts, misgivings, fears, were fain to hide beneath their souls, and not sprout forth a single spear or leaf. In this foreshadowing interval too, all humor, forced or natural, vanished. Stubb, no more strove to raise a smile, Starbuck, no more strove to check one. Alike, joy and sorrow, hope and fear, seemed ground to finest dust, and powdered, for the time, in the clamped mortar of Ahab's iron soul. Like machines, they dumbly moved about the deck, ever conscious that the old man's despot was on them. But did you deeply skin him in his more secret confidential hours, when he thought no glance but one was on him, then you would have seen that even as Ahab's eyes so awed the crews, the inscrutable Parsi's glance awed his, or somehow, at least, in some wild way, at times affected it. Such an added, gliding strangeness began to invest the thin fed Allah now, such ceaseless shuddering shook him, that the men looked dubious at him, half uncertain, as it seemed, whether indeed he were a mortal substance, or else a tremulous shadow cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body. And that shadow was always hovering there. For not by night, even, had fed Allah ever certainly been known to slumber, or go below. He would stand still for hours, but never sat or leaned, his one but wondrous eyes did plainly say, We two watchmen never rest. Nor, at any time, by night or day could the mariners now step upon the deck, unless Ahab was before them either standing in his pivot hole, or exactly pacing the planks between two undeviating limits, the mainmast and the mizzen, or else they saw him standing in the cabin scuttle, his living foot advanced upon the deck, as if to step, his hat slouched heavily over his eyes, so that however motionless he stood, however the days and nights were added on, that he had not swung in his hammock, yet. Hidden beneath that slouching hat, they could never tell unerringly whether, for all this, his eyes were really closed at times, or whether he was still intently scanning them, no matter, though he stood so in the scuttle for a whole hour on the stretch, and the unheeded night damp gathered in beads of dew upon that stone-carved coat and hat. The clothes that the night had wet, the next day's sunshine dried upon him, and so, day after day, and night after night, he went no more beneath the planks, whatever he wanted from the cabin that thing he sent for. He ate in the same open air, that is, his two only meals, breakfast and dinner, supper he never touched, nor reaped his beard, which darkly grew all gnarled, as unearthed roots of trees blown over, which still grow idly on at naked base, though perished in the upper verdure. But though his whole life was now become one watch on deck, and though the Parsi's mystic watch was without intermission as his own, yet these two never seemed to speak, one man to the other, unless at long intervals some passing unmomentous matter made it necessary. Though such a potent spell seemed secretly to join the twain, openly, and to the awestruck crew, they seemed pull like asunder. If by day they chanced to speak one word, by night, dumb men were both, so far as concerned the slightest verbal interchange. At times, for longest hours, without a single hail, they stood far parted in the starlight, Ahab in his scuttle, the Parsi by the mainmast, but still fixedly gazing upon each other, as if in the Parsi Ahab saw his forethrown shadow, in Ahab the Parsi his abandoned substance. And yet, somehow, did Ahab, in his own proper self, as daily, hourly, and every instant, commandingly revealed to his subordinates, Ahab seemed an independent lord, the Parsi but his slave. Still again both seemed yoked together, and an unseen tyrant driving them, the lean shade siding the solid rib. For be this Parsi what he may, all rib and keel was solid Ahab. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from aft, men the mastheads. And all through the day, 
till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour, at the striking of the helmsman's bell, was heard, what do you see, sharp? Sharp! But when three or four days had slided by, after meeting the children seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity, at least, of nearly all except the pagan harpooners, he seemed to doubt, even, whether Stubb and Flask might not willingly overlook the sight he sought. But if these suspicions were really his, he sagaciously refrained from verbally expressing them, however his actions might seem to hint them. I will have the first sight of the whale myself, he said. I. Ahab must have the doubloon, and with his own hands he rigged a nest of basket bolins, and sending a hand aloft, with a single sheep block, to secure to the mainmast head, he received the two ends of the downward reeved rope, and attaching one to his basket, prepared a pin for the other end, in order to fasten it at the rail. This done, with that end yet in his hand and standing beside the pin, he looked round upon his crew, sweeping from one to the other, pausing his glance long upon Degu, Quequeg, Tashtego, but shunning Fedala, and then settling his firm relying eye upon the chief mate, said, Take the rope, sir, I give it into thy hands, Starbuck. Then arranging his person in the basket, he gave the word for them to hoist him to his perch, Starbuck being the one who secured the rope at last, and afterwards stood near it. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles, ahead, astern, the side, and that, within the wide expanded circle commanded at so great a height. When in working with his hands at some lofty, almost isolated place in the rigging, which chances to afford no foothold, the sailor at sea is hoisted up to that spot, and sustained there by the rope, under these circumstances, its fastened end on deck is always given in strict charge to some one man who has the special watch of it. Because in such a wilderness of running rigging, whose various different relations aloft cannot always be infallibly discerned by what is seen of them at the deck, and when the deck ends of these ropes are being every few minutes cast down from the fastenings, it would be but a natural fatality, if, unprovided with a constant watchman, the hoisted sailor should by some carelessness of the crew be cast adrift and fall all swooping to the sea. So Ahab's proceedings in this matter were not unusual, the only strange thing about them seemed to be, that Starbuck, almost the one only man who had ever ventured to oppose him with anything in the slightest degree approaching to decision, one of those two, whose faithfulness on the lookout he had seemed to doubt somewhat, it was strange, that this was the very man he should select for his watchman, freely giving his whole life into such an otherwise distrusted person's hands. Now, the first time Ahab was perched aloft, ere he had been there ten minutes, one of those red-billed savage seahawks, which so often fly incommodiously close round the man mastheads of whalemen in these latitudes, one of these birds came wheeling and screaming round his head in a maze of untrackably swift circlings. Then it darted a thousand feet straight up into the air, then spiralized downwards, and went eddying again round his head. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird, nor, indeed, would any one else have marked it much, it being no uncommon circumstance, only now almost the least heedful eye seemed to see some sort of cunning meaning in almost every sight. Your hat, your hat, sir, suddenly cried the Sicilian seaman, who being posted at the mizzenmast head, stood directly behind Ahab, though somewhat lower than his level, and with a deep gulf of air dividing them. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes, the long hooked bill at his head, with a scream, the black hawk darted away with his prize. An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it, and thereupon Tanaquil, his wife, declared that Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good. Ahab's hat was never restored, the wild hawk flew on and on with it, far in advance of the prow and at last disappeared, while from the point of that disappearance, a minute black spot was dimly discerned, falling from that vast height into the sea.